Hi everyone, this is going to be part two of our series, Trinitarian Crimes Against the Word. And what we're deal dealing with is the deletion, the deleting of this day I have begotten thee, from both Matthew and Luke, chapter, actually both chapter three, in the face of overwhelming textual evidence that it was always there. And um, we showed you last time that uh, ultimately there was a battle between Augustine and uh, Bishop Faustus, and basically Augustine lost because Faustus beat him, basically. And all he could do was say, well, maybe some say there's a, a manuscript of Luke that doesn't have these words this day. He's gotten me at Jesus' baptism. But he didn't say, I went and saw them. He didn't say affirmatively that, that they exist. He said, he said simply, someone said, and we'll see that. Okay, so now we have to ask ourselves, why would Satan want this out of the Bible? For the very reasons that God wants it in the Bible, meaning that, that uh, God spoke over Jesus at the baptism in front of many witnesses, and that those witnesses could testify of having heard the words of God, and then would um, then people would know, oh, we see that fulfills this statement in Psalms. But Psalm 2 is not an actual prophecy. What it is, is it's saying there's this communication going on back and forth between the Father and the Son, and uh, it doesn't have any predictive nature to it. I mean, you know, you don't go, oh, well, this is the guy who it is. If The only way this can be effectuated is God has to speak out loud in the hearing of people to say, this is him, this is the guy. So this is one of those unique kind of prophecies that don't cannot be effectuated except by God's intervention in time to to identify who the person is. Do you see the point? So so now let's read this and then we're going to uh, get to the next uh, panel. So the Dead Sea Scrolls I've picked here because why? Because if you're a Jewish person, you're watching this, you go, okay, I wonder if my Bible reads the same thing as his Bible. So this way you don't worry. This is all like 100, 200 years before Christ. So it says here, uh, Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. I will tell of the decree. Yahweh said to me, this is the, the, the person who's also called Mashiach in this passage, You are my son. Today I become your father. So let's look at why he's, he's called Mashiach in the next, uh, in, when we see the, see the whole context. Okay, so now I want to read the greater context of uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls. Again, this is from the Dead Sea Scrolls, and it only has verses 1 to 8. There's a couple more, and I'll read that in the next slide. So let's read this. And we'll see the anointed is mentioned here, and that's in Hebrew, it'd be Mashiach. Why do the nations conspire, and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord, that'd be Yahweh, and against his anointed, Mashiach, saying, let us tear their bonds asunder and cast their cords from us. So the rulers of the earth don't want to be under God's control and under his Messiah. But what's God's response? Verse 4, he who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and frighten them in his fury as follows. But I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. Then verse 7 this appears to be the Mashiach speaking, so you'll know it when you hear it. I will indeed make known the Lord's decree. He said to me, you are my son today, I have begotten you. That clearly is the Mashiach speaking. Ask of me, and I will surely make the nations your inheritance. So now God is speaking again. So Yahweh starts back like a response as a conversation. Ask for me, and I will surely make the nations your inheritance in the very ends of the earth your possession. So this is a universal ruler, the Mashiach. Okay, so the verses that are not covered, uh, the, the verses that remain to be looked at, there were a couple of verses that don't aren't important to look at right now. 11 and 12 um, are important. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. When his wrath is kindled but a little, blessed are all those who put their trust in him. So... Uh, this is, seems to be saying that Messiah is the son of God, or, you know, I, he's begotten now, and this is how we are to respond to him. We are to kiss the son, and that really means he's probably got a royal ring, and we're to do obeisance, which means kiss the ring, 
he's your judge and he can decide your fate don't kindle his wrath against you blessed or happy are those who put their trust in him and i put the hebrew word on below that those who put their trust is how say all right so uh, i think we have a picture of what psalm 2 is and why god has to speak this doesn't have any active way of proving or prediction it has to be god has to speak from heaven to activate this passage so it's just a sitting waiting there to for god to use and he has to say it from heaven in the witness in the front of witnesses and again the the witnesses were all the people who are at the baptism of john we learn in acts 1 that that's actually where all the original 12 came from so when they had to replace uh, judas they actually had to find another person who would also been at john's baptism and had seen been with jesus through his entire ministry until the crucifixion and ascension okay so now we're going to dig in a little deeper last time we gave you bishop faustus's arguments against uh you know keeping the eternal son doctrine in the nicene creed okay and he was saying you if you either have to pick to be follow what matthew says or you have to pick what the nicene creed says and if you are a christian you can't you can't use this nicene creed because it's false you can't have an eternal son of god so that's what he was arguing and so now augustine's responding and augustine has this very pathetic response where he conjectures that they're it's said it's not found in some of the older manuscripts but i want you to hear the context context so you can make your own decision and here's what he says but once more with respect to the rendering which is contained in some codices of the gospel according to luke and which bears that the words heard in the heavenly voice were those that are written in the psalm thou art my son this day i have begotten thee psalm 2 7. so he's conceding that there are manuscripts some some codices that say it doesn't say he knows of any that don't this is where he turns around he says although it is said not to be found in the more ancient greek codices but he doesn't say who said it and he doesn't say he knows it it's just simply a throwaway it's it's non-proof it's hearsay if anything it doesn't have any reliability unless he's willing to say he's seen the the codices that doesn't have it so he's just throwing it out there and you'll see how people later deliberately well people deliberately miscategorize what he's saying and they say he clearly says that, uh, that there are codices that don't have it well he didn't ever say that okay anyway continuing yet if it can be established by any copies worthy of credit what results but that we suppose both voices to have been heard from heaven in one of the other verbal order so he's he's actually what it sounds to be like he's saying he's implying that maybe the one in front of him isn't that way but he doesn't say that he's he's now conjecturing well if there were copies of credit that that um have it or didn't have it what would we suppose you say you'd have two conflicting voices one has and one doesn't have it so how do we know that's what i think he's suggesting and he's sort of implying that maybe his copy doesn't have it but he won't say that so you see it's just a, it's it's just a a buff he's trying to befuddle his opponent but the but, but i would read it as an opponent saying you don't have any evidence because you just made it up you just said there's some say this and you don't say who no one to verify what you're saying no way of proving what you're saying now the people who argue about this from the other side are always trying to trying to throw out the word adoptionist and i did tell with this last time is if is if being a begot jesus being begotten as the son of god was him being adopted by god and somehow adoptionism is a heresy but i showed you last week it was an eighth century heresy where people were denying that jesus was ever the son of god and he was only god, a son of god by adoption which is not what god is saying you know in psalm 2 i made him my son he's begotten of me but what's the reason why this is a totally the true reason why it's rejected now it's not that it's heresy again of some adoptionist uh, adoptionist claim because that's not what people are saying who rely on psalm 2 7 god is not adopting jesus it's because you can't make out the eternal son doctrine so listen to hodge he's a famous uh, com, uh famous uh, theologian and he says actually here's the problem he says if this language from psalm 2 7 could be applied to jesus it is a more plausible objection to the eternal son doctrine that's the truth he says this more plausible objections are found on certain passages of scripture in psalm 2 7 it is said thou art my son this day have i begotten you not adopted you 
From this, it is argued that Christ and the Messiah was constituted or made the Son of God in time and therefore was not the Son of God from eternity. That's the problem. That's the heresy. But not against the Bible, but against a man-made tradition called the Nicene Creed, as we showed you last time. And that's, that's why uh, words of God from heaven speaking which were in the Bible for over 380 years, were removed after this time. Every Christian should be outraged. I just, I just, I just wish I can convey it to you so that you would feel the outrage you should be feeling that these words had been removed from Scripture that would help Jewish people, would help Christian people to even understand what are the Messianic prophecies? How did God tell us Jesus was the Messiah from his own lips from heaven? But we don't know it because it's taken out of the word of God and by people who are Protestants, not just Roman Catholics. It's suppressed. And not just that, suppressed where people have been killed on the Protestant side for denying the eternal son doctrine. And we'll get into that in a minute. And just so we can clear the field so that you will listen, those of you who are in dissent and you don't want to listen, let's clear the field any idea of the eternal Son God, God doctrine is an irrational, an ir irrationality is from Satan. It isn't God. God is a rational God. He may have emotions, but he he would never say something that's self-contradictory. To ever say the word eternal Son is self-contradictory. Listen, Adam Clark, a Methodist, a commentator of good spiritual sense, says it's always a contradiction in terms. Here's his words. Listen to him. It's not me. It is demonstrated that the doctrine of the eternal sonship of Christ is absolutely irreconcilable to reason and contradictory to itself. Eternity is that which has no beginning nor stands in any reference to time. Son supposes time, generation, and father, and time also antecedent to such generation. Therefore, the rational conjunction of these two terms, son and eternity, is absolutely impossible, as they, as they imply essentially different and opposite ideas. So get it out of your mind that there is such a thing. And I just want to show you the depths of human depravity was involved in the killing of Miguel Servetus. Here's this guy who's being burned alive, which even the Roman Catholics wouldn't do. But the Calvinists had no problem killing this guy with green, the greenest wood they could find, meaning it would take the longest to burn and torture this man. And they were hoping he would eventually confess the eternal son of God. And he wouldn't. And the last thing he said before the fire finally killed him was, Oh, Jesus, son of the eternal God. And what do you think Farrell, the agent of Calvin, says to him? says to people later, Farrell noted the servitus might have been saved by shifting the position of an adjective and confessing Christ as the eternal son rather than as the son of the eternal God. They would have taken him out of the fire. Do you see how evil this doctrine is that they murdered someone for saying the truth who wouldn't bow to irrationality and knew that God begot Jesus in time and therefore he could not be the eternal son. He became the Son of God at his baptism. And that's what's being destroyed at the, in these passages that you can no longer see and not allowed to see because they've been removed from the holy words of God. And actually, they're the words of Yahweh from heaven. I, I just don't understand how people don't get, get upset thinking about this. I it's just, hmm, okay. Okay, so we're going to calm down here. Sorry, I got a little, a little excited there. So I just want you to see a textual commentator is going to show you calmly all the references that there is to support this issue in textual references and in letters and everything. Then I'm going to show you later the actual quotes. He's just going to give you the, the uh, references. This is Wyland Wilker in a textual commentary on the Greek Gospels, Volume 3, Luke. And this is only Luke 3.22. Uh, he didn't do something on Matthew, so I'm just going to go with this. So just to show you right here, this is it. This is the, uh, the stage, uh, he's begotten me. So it's even in Latin, okay? Ego, O, D, A, Genui, T, right? This stage begotten me. D, 
means the, the uh, codex BZ, so it's in there. IT, now I don't know all these symbols, but IT I'm pretty sure means the, um, the uh, what is it, the Vulgate, the different forms of the Vulgate. Justin, it appears two times, Eusebius, Methodius, I think that's Hillary, Augustine, I'm not sure who Gray and Bois is, but there's someone else. But anyway, lots of lots of proof references. But he's, he has a lot more. He's got Clement, and I have all these, so you know we'll pull them up. Um, Clement, the Gospel of the Ebionites. We're not going to do the Ebionites this this uh, this episode. I want you to have that in a separate episode. He has Justin, so this is someone from the early uh, early church in the hundreds. Same thing. Here's where he explains something. The words also appear in the Didascalia, so that's early 200s. Or again, cites them in his commentary on John, Book 1, 32, and several other fathers. And, you know, that's the name they use for these uh, early leaders. Methodius, book there, Lanctatius, I have that for you later to look at. Augustine and Chiridion. Faustus, which is also the debate between him and Augustine. Tychonius, Hilary, and Juvencus. Juvencus. Not in all cases, it is clear that they really are citing from Luke because it's also from Matthew. Mr. Wilker actually gives you a direct quote right out of the Codex Bize, which is what? This is the, this is part of the Textus Receptus. This is part of what the King James Bible says it was relying upon. But these words do not appear in the King James Bible because why? Did you, do you know who the King James Bible was edited by? It was edited by two editors-in-chief who are Calvinists. And the Geneva Bible was the first one to look at the Codex Bize and make a Bible. And it didn't include, you are my son, today I have begotten you, either. Because it's violative of their doctrine. They killed a man in Geneva over this very issue and burned him at the stake. Because he wouldn't say Jesus is the eternal son. He said Jesus was God. This is what people don't understand. Servetus said Jesus was God. That was, if you read his book, he did say that. But he said, I can't say he's the eternal son of God. <laughs> so he is killed because he won't say something that's irrational, which is contradictory. And only makes sense if you can believe that Jesus is begotten, not made, which is what they tell you in the Nicene Creed which makes him a, a bizarre freak of nature, that he could be a self-contradiction, both be both never being made and yet he's begotten by God. doesn't make any sense. Okay, I just want to say preliminarily before we get into all the sources is that unfortunately the Alexandrinus, which often gives us some reference points, is the oldest text in the a certain line called the Alexandrian line. And... Um, but basically, it doesn't have, the, it's missing the first 25 pages of Matthew up to 25, 6. So we're really kind of crippled there. So you have to rely on manuscripts that are pretty late uh, in that lineage of, of manuscripts to, to know anything about what's the original. So it turns out, when you really think about it, Codex Bize is the oldest. And then you could have the Sinaiticus, but you know what? I'm beginning to have doubts that that is as old as it's alleged to be. It was a very important uh, video I saw recently that uh, there was a recovery of some somebody who knew uh, um, of the manuscript and knew of the layout of the four columns and the two columns. And that's something from the mid 400s. And then there's other indications that would put it actually after the 1300s. And it is actually a high quality looking book. So you kind of wonder, you know, is this really as old as this? So I'm going to actually, I'm actually coming around to the idea that Codex Bize is the more reliable dated document to the four, 400 AD. And that probably is our oldest only manuscript, almost, almost complete manuscript of the Bible. Okay, and here he, this Wyland Wilker, put in Augustine, I told you what he said, you know, some codices of the, uh, he says, uh, the rendering which is contained in some codices of the Gospel of Luke bared the statement, Thou art my son, this day have begotten thee. So he's implying that there are some that aren't that way, but he doesn't say, I know that for a fact. Then he says it's said not to be found in the more ancient codices, but he doesn't, he's not saying he knows that. It's just some hearsay he's heard, but he hasn't gone to verify. He has no proof. This is known as a statement that means nothing. Okay, this is a reference that Acts 13, uh, 
verse 33 also makes reference. Uh, God, uh, God has in full completed this to us through children, having raised up Jesus as also in the second psalm. It has been written, you are my son, today I have begotten you. So it was a, a well-known passage that applied to Jesus. Do we know about this today? No. When we see this, do we pay attention? No. Because this is not jibing with our idea that Jesus could be begotten in time. We think he, he's an eternal son because that's what everybody has told us. And Wyland Wilker, I really like this. He said the so-called adoptionistic or Ebionite reading. Yes, it's not adoptionistic. It's, it's simply a begotten reading. He was begotten in time. Anyway, he's saying, he's saying this idea of this day I've begotten. He says this reading, the reading, seems to have been widespread and early. So it's an early doctrine. It's an early passage. Internally, it is clearly to be favored. So he's agreeing this day of begotten should be favored. It is the harder reading, and the text reading is possibly a harmonization to Matthew and Mark. Why is it a harder reading? Well, there's a couple of reasons, but I won't go into it now. But it means it's the less likely thing you would say that this day of begotten applied to Jesus if you were just trying to make some points, because it does seem to wrap up against the virgin birth account, which is a whole other reason to think about this over again. But regardless, it doesn't matter. It's textually the true original version. Acts 13.33 shows that Psalm 2 verse 7 is clearly connected with Jesus from early on. Where did the author of Hebrews get this quote? Now he's referring to Hebrews uh, chapter 5 verse 5. And I mentioned to you last time that that was an, uh, a thing that Augustine missed and he left it in the Bible. And so there is an actual reference to this passage applicable to Jesus in the epistle to Hebrews. Did he know of Luke in this form? So these are just questions he's throwing out. And uh, Harnack, a commentator, he has that same view I was telling you about the virgin birth account chapters one and two. That's kind of a, you know, are you... Are, so we have to then understand in what sense was Jesus son of God when he's born versus when he's son of God at his baptism. So there is that tension of like, how does this work? But God in his infinite knowledge said, I gave I gave him begottenness at his baptism, not when he is born. Anyway, Harnack says, argues in favor of the D reading, that is the Codex Bize reading. For Luke, this reading is inconvenient considering chapters 1 and 2 for the reasons I just mentioned. He could have simply followed Mark here. This means that he followed Q, which is really the more theoretical original gospel. And I think that what I relate that to is the Hebrew Matthew, which he considered superior. He also follows Q, think Hebrew Matthew, before and after this. This then... This then means that a report of the baptism was in Q and that read, it read that the words from heaven as given in D in Codex Pisa and the Old Latin. And the Old Latin, you saw that list, the IT and then all the uh, items. That means it's in all these Vulgates until the 405. And I'm going to tell you right now, it's removed in 405. But again, the dates are what? You had this meeting between, this letter debate going on between Augustine and Faustus, and and Augustine loses. He has that pathetic explanation. Well, you know, I've heard that it's it's might not be in some of the early codices, <laughs> with a, without no proof, and that's why he got defeated. And then he has his ability to manipulate things later if he wants to to try to, to try to protect the eternal son doc eternal son doctrine. Okay, so we're going to stop right there, and we're going to look at the actual uh, quotations from letters and from uh, ma early manuscripts, Codex Bizet. I think we've already looked at Codex Bizet, but we're going to look at um, m much more proof and give us a greater confidence that God did speak this way over Jesus Christ, that Jewish people can say, hey, you know, uh, I can believe it because, you know, th these people put their lives down because of this experience that they had a shared common experience of hearing the words of God spoken from heaven over this man. And they trusted it, and that's why they were willing to die for it. And and it was, uh, and that's what propelled Christianity. That's what propelled people to follow Jesus was God speaking from heaven. You can't disobey Yahweh, right? So uh, anyway, and um, I hope this has been edifying to people, gives you some idea of our Christian history and of the paths we have to, how we have to get out of this is we have to get uh, certain doctrines out of our heads that, that are blocking us from accepting back into the canon 
words that were removed. We already talked about 2 Peter 1.10. That was two words taken out, good works. Now we need to add in a few more words. <laughs> this day I've begotten thee. That has to go back in. And, and it's important, significantly important for evangelism. And, and just the fact it's the truth of God. So anyway, but we're going to prove it more in the next episode. So I hope this was helpful and edifying. And we'll get to you next time. Ciao. Bye.